Uh, but anyway, thank you so much for coming. I recognize a lot of uh, friends in the room. And uh, I'd like to uh, uh, perhaps use uh, about 25 minutes or so before the commentary uh, to uh, give you first a sense as to how I uh, you know, started to think about uh, this problem in the way I, I did. Uh, then I want to tell you uh, exactly why I got into trouble with uh, my uh, advisor, my thesis advisor over this uh, topic. And uh, Miguel knows uh, the whole story about that uh, because uh, Actually, as you know, my, well, the person who used to be my dissertation advisor, Chick Perot, um, strongly disagrees with me about uh, you know, the use of uh, some of his uh, theories to, uh, to try to understand uh, you know, why the uh, global system has become so prone to, uh, to crisis and so on and so forth. And then I'll try to give you a, uh, a few glimpses about uh, the argument uh, and just uh, a few instances of the data. I was uh, telling Miguel uh, prior to uh, coming to uh, uh, entering the building that uh, I, I actually think uh, this book is more like a manifesto, like a, a statement of uh, things that need to be done, rather than the definitive uh, statement or theory or analysis of, uh, of why uh, we um, are confronting this uh, kind of situation in the world. But let me just uh, first tell you how all of this uh, started. Uh, so about uh, six or seven years ago, uh, I was uh, you know, trying to uh, understand um, uh, and measure empirically uh, whether the world had become smaller or not as a result of uh, globalization in the sense of uh, you know, whether countries had become more alike uh, one another along a number of dimensions, uh, uh, institutional dimensions, right? So, so political, economic, uh, cultural, administrative, uh, organizational, and so on and so forth. And the basic idea was to see if uh, over time, right, what we found was convergence or divergence. In other words, that the nodes in the global system that are countries, right, whether they were coming closer together because they were becoming more similar, right? So in other words, the distance between nodes, dyadic distances were becoming uh, smaller. And, um, uh, you know, we did a, uh, an analysis based on a number of measures, right? And uh, my prior uh, was that, uh, well, if the world is becoming more similar, right, the countries are becoming closer to one another, they're becoming more similar. That's actually a recipe for disaster, I thought, uh, because what I think makes uh, systems in general, that was my in initial thought, right, what makes uh, systems um, uh, more resilient uh, to uh, failure or to, uh, 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 you know, crisis or to, uh, is that you have diversity, right, uh, built into it. And therefore then when uh, something uh, gets out of whack, something gets out of balance, uh, then you can, uh, you know, somehow the uh, different uh, components or different pieces can, uh, reorganize themselves or can, uh, you know, cope with the situation. And, uh, you know, what uh, we, um, what we um, uh, try to do was essentially use, we borrowed the methodology from um, uh, climate uh, change, um, you know, climate change scholars and uh, also chemistry, which was to calculate uh, minimum volume ellipsoids, right? So what would be the, uh, as you can see in the previous chart over here, the previous um, uh, slide, what would be the, uh, the uh, ellipsoid that would, um, you know, uh, encompass all of the uh, points, and the points are countries, right? And then in that way, you can measure the volume, right, in a, in a multi-dimensional uh, space. And well, then we were assessing whether the volume was getting smaller or bigger over time, right? Uh, so that was the approach. By the way, this paper got rejected in all of the main uh, sociology journals uh, before it got, uh, it got published in a, uh, in a management <laughs> journal. Uh, but that was the methodology that we followed, and uh, we considered a number of uh, dimensions, as you can see over there. And we also measured these not for the entire world as a whole, but also for subcomponents, uh, like, for example, core, semi-periphery periphery, uh, countries, uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, world system analysis. And we also took a look at uh, trade blocks, right, different kinds of trade blocks in the world, ranging from the European Union, which is one of the most integrated, uh, to, you know, to the NAFTA, to other kinds of trade blocks in the world. And uh, what we found uh, was actually uh, the opposite of what I was expecting, which was that actually these volumes were increasing over time, meaning that there was divergence, right? Uh, and that um, uh, also most of these subcomponents were getting bigger, uh, but that the subcomponents were also becoming, you know, more differentiated or more different, uh, you know, uh, among themselves, okay? So, and in particular also, by the way, we found that the European Union over time uh, was also becoming bigger, meaning that the differences and the cleavages and the uh, disparities among the member countries were actually becoming bigger over time, not, not smaller, okay? Uh, yeah. So um, then came the idea of, uh, you know, essentially thinking, okay, more broadly, what is it that an organizational sociologist like myself uh, could do in terms of conceptualizing why, you know, we have in the world uh, this uh, apparent phenomenon of, uh, you know, more and more crisis occurring, right? Uh, 
uh, when you take a look at uh, the uh, 1980s, the 1990s, and uh, the most recent decade when compared to previous decades. Uh, over here you have the data that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, Reinhard and Rogoff out of Harvard. Uh, they, they, they put together this database which is available online with uh, different kinds of crises uh, that they counted between 1800 and the year 2010. It's important to keep in mind, by the way, that they covered the same 70 countries or economies over that very long time period. Uh, so for instance, although India didn't become independent until the 1940s, they were tracking you know, over time whether India had experienced uh, some kind of a crisis. And uh, just to give you a sense of the uh, chart here, which is also in the book, they uh, consider currency, inflation, stock market, domestic debt, external debt, and banking crisis. And uh, what they found was this, right? That the number of crises uh, that you see, that's the thick line, has been going up. And also the countries, uh, the number of countries affected. And over the last uh, you know, 25 years or 30 years, with uh, considerable ups and downs, of course, we had many, of these, uh, many more of these uh, crises occurring in the world right, than in any other uh, period uh, in the past, including the, uh, the, 19, the late 1920s and 1930s. Okay, so that's the, uh, kind of the problem that I wanted to, uh, to address. That's the book, as you know. Um, so why so many crises, right? So the argument essentially is, uh, you know, the take, uh, my take on it is it has to do with the structure of the global system, right? So something about the structure of the global system has changed over the last uh, 20 or 30 years that has produced a situation in which it just becomes more likely that there will be frictions, that there will be problems, and uh, eventually a uh, crisis, right? Uh, and it also has to do with uh, another issue, which is the strength of the resilience of individual economies. Uh, when it comes to um, coping with a crisis, right, and overcoming the problems that come with the crisis, all right? Um, and as, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the book, I essentially play around with two concepts that were pioneered in organizational sociology by, by my, 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 my advisor, Chick Perot, uh, complexity and coupling, right, which I will uh, explain with some examples in a moment. And what I do in the book is essentially try to um, um, uh, uh, produce examples or situations in which uh, what you have is uh, either increased uh, shock diffusion, so there's some disturbance that occurs in some part of the system, the global system, and then, uh, well, that diffuses very quickly, and also looking at uh, situations in which, or structures or uh, configurations in which uh, there is shock absorption, right? So that's just the opposite. In other words, uh, somehow there are firewalls that uh, get uh, uh, created. Uh, that prevent uh, those crises from, from spreading uh, throughout the, uh, the system, okay? So let me just illustrate uh, uh, you know, some of these dynamics with the, uh, with the two uh, concepts here. What's important for you to keep in mind is that, so I'm talking here about complexity and coupling, and I'm gonna explain in a moment uh, what those two concepts are uh, in this context. Uh, and then I'm also, I also have another dimension, which is I apply those two concepts to both relationships between countries, right? So the arches in a network, right? and the nodes themselves, okay, all right? So both, uh, so I talk about the complexity and the coupling of relationships, right, between countries, and I also talk about the complexity and the coupling of the nodes themselves, meaning economies or, or countries, right, in that, in that network. Um, so um, first uh, thing here that I, I want you then to consider in that two by two, there's four different uh, concepts then, right? So the first one is network complexity. I argue in the book that this is uh, shock absorbing, right? So a system is uh, an, uh, a system, you know, so the network complexity uh, is, uh, is a system is more complex when you just have, you know, uh, more nodes and you also have more interconnections among them, right? Okay, all right, that's uh, sheer complexity, right? Okay, uh, so uh, first of all, of course, we have more economies in the world. Uh, uh, you know, over the last 30 years, we've ended up with more economies in the world integrated into the global trading and financial system. So that's a, an indicator of uh, increased uh, complexity. Uh, we also have uh, higher levels of, uh, of trade and higher levels of foreign direct investment. Uh, uh, and that again manifests, those two phenomena manifest themselves in terms of dyadic flows, right, between you know, an origin country and a destination country. I argue that that's complexity, not coupling. I'll, I'll get to coupling in a moment. Uh, and then we also have uh, some other um, you know, variables that have gone to uh, ever higher levels, including tourism and migration and uh, information flows. Regarding migration, I'm looking at Doug Massey. I initially thought that uh, migration uh, as a, uh, something that increases network complexity is something that is actually shock absorbing, right? So I was perhaps a little bit naive, but let me just uh, tell you what the argument is. Uh, the argument is that uh, to the extent that there's a uh, migration, I, uh, maybe you'll, you'll be sympathetic to this, uh, that provides uh, economies, right? Or societies or countries, nodes in the system with a safety valve, right? So in other words, to the extent that there's a possibility of migrating, right? 
that actually can, you know, uh, lower the pressure, right, in high fertility countries, right, for instance, that don't, um, you know, generate enough jobs or opportunities for those people. And it can also reduce tensions or frictions or problems in, at the receiving end, right, in countries or nodes in the system uh, that perhaps have labor shortages, so they need, uh, you know, an influx of people, right? So I was kind of naive, you know, about this, uh, but that was uh, the original thinking about it, right? So that's the first, um, the first uh, of four things that I want to bring to your attention. Uh, as elements of this theory, right? The second one is network coupling. So we're still uh, talking here about um, dyadic relationships, the arches in the network, okay? Not about the nodes themselves. Uh, but in this case, I argue uh, that these are shock diffusing. So what's the difference between coupling and uh, complexity? Coupling refers to, uh, you know, how, um, uh, you know, um, uh, what would be the way to put it? How um, closely related are two nodes in a system, okay? Uh, and uh, increased coupling manifests itself in the form of reduced degrees of freedom or less tolerance in terms of the relationship between those two nodes, right? So to the extent that two nodes are very tightly coupled, right, that literally means, right, that there's very little room for making adjustments. You see what I'm saying? There's very little tolerance built into that uh, relationship. Uh, there's very few degrees of freedom for making adjustments in case there is a disturbance or there's something, an external shock that, uh, you know, um, um, uh, destabilizes the, uh, the relationship, okay? Uh, so I highlight in the book five of these, but here in the uh, presentation I want to highlight especially three that I think have contributed enormously over the last 25 years to tighter coupling in the global system and in many cases to the uh, diffusion of uh, crisis, okay? Especially economic crisis, but not only those. And those are foreign portfolio investments, uh, currency exchange turnover, and cross-border banking assets, okay? Uh, so in the book, I make a more detailed argument as to why these are different from just uh, foreign direct investment or uh, trade, okay? Which, remember, I uh, uh, link to complexity and therefore shock absorption as opposed to uh, shock diffusion, right? Let me just show you uh, some of the uh, data in the book and then why I argue that these are shock diffusing, right? So uh, this is how much uh, prior to the crisis in 2008, uh, the level of uh, relative to GDP in the world, this is for the entire world, uh, the level of uh, foreign portfolio investment uh, grew, right? In terms of the stock of assets, right? As, as of the end of each year. So you see this uh, huge uh, increase from 25% in the mid-1990s all the way to 70% uh, of GDP, right? On the eve of the, uh, of the crisis, okay? Why is this something that um, uh, is dangerous? Why is this something that uh, I identify as a coupling mechanism, something that acts as a shock diffusing? Well, the IMF itself, you know, uh, in a uh, very recent um, um, article, uh, so a couple of uh, IMF economists produced the, uh, the evidence for that, right? So here what you have is uh, countries that experience a financial crisis and or banking crisis. And uh, as you can see over here, the red bar is for countries uh, that didn't uh, experience a surge in um, uh, portfolio capital inflows, right, prior to the crisis. And then the, uh, the red bar, uh, are countries that did experience such a surge. And as you can see, the uh, probability or the frequency of a crisis, right, either a banking crisis or a uh, financial crisis is way, way higher, right, in the second group of countries, okay? Why is that the case? Well, uh, because uh, uh, portfolio investment or portfolio flows, uh, that's hot money, right? At the first sign of trouble, it may go out. This is what happened, for example, in the 2008-2009 uh, episodes in Eastern Europe, right? And, uh, and uh, essentially, it, uh, it acts as a precipitating factor for a crisis, okay? So I argue that uh, foreign portfolio investment, which, uh, you know, most countries welcome, it's actually a recipe for disaster if you get closer to the, uh, to the edge of the cliff and then, uh, you know, it gets withdrawn. Uh, here you have another indicator of the same thing. Currency exchange turnover is another issue that I think contributes to this. Uh, because once again, to the extent that we have uh, countries' notes in the world that, have, uh, that are sovereign entities and they have their own currencies, they can get into a lot of trouble if their currency comes under attack. And we know that currency markets have become way, way bigger than they used to be over the last 20 years, right? So um, uh, this is a, uh, from the triennial uh, survey that gets conducted on this matter. Back in 1989, uh, currency exchange turnover in the world was the equivalent of about 3% of GDP on a daily basis, right? So every day back in 1989, the equivalent of 3% of global GDP was transacted in currency markets, right? Uh, by the time, um, you know, the, uh, bef just before the crisis, uh, that percentage was 7%. Uh, as you can see, has continued to, uh, 
to increase. And by the way, the reason why it decreased between 98 and 2001 was because of the uh, launching of the euro, right? So essentially you remove uh, a number of currencies that were big currencies that accounted for a lot of turnover and you, uh, 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 in, in, in their place, they, you put just one currency. So you get that reduction over there, right? So that's the second factor. The third is uh, the one that continues to haunt a lot of economists around the world, uh, which is the, uh, the exposure to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the issue with uh, uh, um, the external positions of uh, banks, right? Which if you remember now, Europe has become even a more difficult situation because now those external positions have become internal positions as they've uh, you know, acquired more uh, government bonds of their own country, right? And therefore sovereign risk has become the same uh, as uh, one of the same thing as, uh, as uh, banking risk. But what you see over here is exactly the same thing, right? So this is uh, expressed as a trillion deflated US dollars. So the effect of inflation is already taken out. And you can see that the uh, total number of, uh, the total amount of external positions of banks in the world as of um, um, the late 1970s uh, was about uh, $3 trillion. Again, inflation adjusted. By, uh, you know, by the year, by the end of uh, 2007, just before the crisis, it was 35 trillion in constant dollars, right? Inflation adjusted, okay? And as you can see, most of that, uh, you know, the, uh, the lion's share was uh, in the Eurozone itself, right? So also that concentration of the, over there was really important. You have other indicators over here. Now, the other two elements, and with this I will, I will end, the other two elements in the, uh, in, the, in the book are at the node level, right? So complexity, uncoupling, the same two concepts. But now instead of looking at dyadic relationships, right? Such as trade or investment, whatever it is, it's looking at the resilience of the nodes. And here the argument is the following. The problem that we've had, I think, is that um, those, um, the complexity of the nodes, right? Which is something that in principle should be shock absorbing, should be something that enables economies, enables countries to overcome whatever episodes of crisis come their way, right? We have seen, for the most part, a, uh, an evolution of these indicators that is contrary to this effect, right? So in other words, that the ability of nodes, the ability of countries to cope with these uh, critical situations has been on the decline, right? So the resilience of the nodes is now less than what it used to be uh, 20 or 30 years ago. In the book, I emphasize uh, the following factors. I'm gonna show you some data now, but also uh, explain very quickly what are the, uh, uh, the arguments behind each of them. So democracy, size and capacity of the state, uh, the problem is the state failure in the world, checks and balances, and industrial diversification. Let me just choose um, uh, one. For example, the problem of uh, state uh, capacity, right? So here is not as obvious as with the other ones. So this is the, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Hansen and Sigmund. Uh, state capacity index. I mean, they've put together, I think, a really nice synthetic uh, index for a lot of countries in the world uh, since the 1960s um, on state capacity, right? Which is, of course, a very important sociological variable as well as a, uh, an important one in the uh, political science literature. And as you can see, according to their indicator, right, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, state capacity grew in the world until, on average, until the year more or less 1990. But over the last uh, 20 or 25 years, we've seen either a, uh, you know, a plateau, right? Uh, we've seen a plateau or we've seen a slight decline. Uh, the biggest decline, however, took place in some of the most vulnerable economies, right? Over the last 20 or 25 years, which is uh, uh, many of the uh, formerly uh, socialist uh, countries, okay? So this is just one example. Why does this matter? Well, because when a crisis hits or when you think you're approaching the, uh, you know, the cliff, it does help to have a state uh, bureaucracy in place that is capable of coping with the situation. First, that it has the ability to analyze what the situation is, search for solutions, and then, of course, the most crucial part, which is to implement those solutions, right? It requires a, you know, my argument is that it does require a bureaucratic uh, machinery on the part of the state, and that is something that has been uh, declining, although not uh, very, very quickly. We have, of course, in the developing world, the problem of state failure, and this is just one indicator. Some of you may not like it. It's the one from the Center for Systemic Peace. But we see how the problem of state failure, meaning the fact that in some parts of the world we have uh, anarchy, chaos, lawlessness, uh, uh, just the loss of control, uh, right, uh, uh, on the part of the state, is concentrated in uh, certain economies in the world, as you can see over there, Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of the Middle East, parts of South Asia, which actually happen to be very important right now because those are the parts of the world that are growing demographically the fastest. They are the biggest uh, sources of uh, migrants, right? And uh, they have, of course, very high unemployment and so on and so forth. And but lastly, and most importantly, uh, they account, those parts of the world that you see over there, for 60, 70, 80% of all of the proven reserves of fossil fuels and strategic minerals in the world, right? And that in turn affects uh, you know, global markets for all of those commodities, and, you know, there's all sorts of uh, implications and reverberations, right? 
Um, the other um, uh, issue that I wanted to bring to your attention where there's also been somewhat of a decline is industrial diversification. So this is just a very simple uh, index, which is a uh, herfindahl hirschman index of uh, diversification. The argument here is that an economy that is more complex because it has more of a diversified structure, right, of industries. Right? So for example, Chile is not very well diversified because a lot of it depends on copper and other minerals, right? You see what I'm saying? And in fact, if you take a look at Chile, in spite of uh, you know, years of trying to move away from those uh, industries, they continue to be, relatively speaking, uh, very concentrated, right? Even though they've been throwing money at other kinds of uh, industries, like, like uh, you know, uh, growing salmon, right? And, uh, and uh, wines and fruit and uh, all of these things, right? They continue to be very, very um, dependent on um, exports of uh, uh, production and exports of, uh, of minerals, uh, copper in particular. But again, what we see over here is that over the last uh, few years, um, uh, at least the average Wender, uh, uh, Henderfall index, uh, not the weighted one, uh, you see a, uh, a uh, uh, I'm sorry, with the weighted one, uh, you see an increase in the, in the index, which is, uh, which is bad, right? And then the other last thing that I want you to consider is node coupling. And for me, this is actually the most important uh, part of the, of the argument. So this is the, uh, the fact that, um, that we can see uh, along uh, different numbers of indicators that uh, countries themselves have now fewer degrees of freedom. They have uh, less of an ability to cope with difficult situations because internally they have become more tightly coupled, right? So what are the kinds of things that I, I, I talk about? Uh, so for example, population aging. Why do I argue that population aging, which is happening everywhere in the world, right? Even in Sub-Saharan Africa, right? Slowly but surely, right? But certainly it's happening in Japan, it's happening in China, it's happening in Western Europe. It's happening to a lesser extent uh, in the United States. Population aging reduces the degrees of freedom of any government, right? For many reasons. I mean, one of them is fiscal, right? But the other one is in terms of economic options, right? And what is it that you do, right? When you have 30, 40, even 50% of the population above age 50, right? Uh, uh, so again, that, that is something that I identify with. The other one is urbanization. I'm not gonna talk too much about that. Public debt, I think, is an obvious one that reduces the ability of governments to engage in policies uh, that perhaps under other circumstances they might be able to, uh, to engage in. This, as you know, has been affecting primarily the advanced economies, the richest uh, economies in the world, especially Europe, uh, the United States, because it essentially removes um, you know, at least half of the uh, toolkit that uh, policymakers have at their disposal in order to cope with crisis, right? Uh, uh, which is uh, fiscal policy uh, from the, uh, uh, you know, from the available set of, uh, of policies. And uh, lastly, I argue uh, quite strongly in the book, and I'm happy to expand on this argument, that uh, the trend towards uh, rising uh, income and also wealth inequality, this is an indicator of income inequality across the world in most countries, not in all of them, but in many of them. Uh, it's also something that, uh, you know, puts a lot of pressure on uh, and creates a coupling, right? But puts a lot of pressure on governments uh, and reduces their degrees of freedom for coping with uh, situations uh, that are, um, uh, you know, conducive to, uh, to crisis in the sense that uh, it just uh, divides the, uh, the society, um, you know, polarizes it, makes it so much harder to uh, reach consensus over basic uh, policies that perhaps need to be implemented in order to avoid a crisis, right? And that just makes it uh, so much, much harder for any government to come up with a policy uh, that would be accepted by a reasonably large proportion of the uh, population. So in sum, uh, let me just take a, a couple more minutes, if that's okay. Uh, what, what I argue in the book is uh, essentially that, uh, yes, it's uh, absolutely true that the global system has become more complex, both at the network level and at the node level over the last, uh, you know, let's say 20 or 30 years. Uh, and that at the same time, it has also simultaneously become much more tightly coupled, right? According to the variables that I was, uh, uh, you know, follow, uh, using those indicators that I mentioned uh, before. Uh, in particular, I argue in the book that the problem lies not so much with the complexity, because in fact, the complexity can be shock absorbing, especially at the node level, okay? The problem lies with the increased levels of coupling, both at the level of the network, the other relationships, and within countries, right? Why? Well, because then what you observe is that uh, whatever shocks occur in some part of the system spread much, much faster, like wildfire, from one corner of the global system to another, right? As we've seen, right, in several instances uh, in the recent past. And that's at the level of the network. At the level of the uh, nodes, meaning the countries, uh, you end up in a situation in which there's fewer shock-absorbing mechanisms, right, 
to cope, right, to act as buffers against uh, you know, those shocks that occur, right, or act uh, or, uh, uh, in terms of firewalls that get created. So in other words, what I'm trying to say in plain English is that countries have become not strong enough to absorb shocks because of changes in node complexity and node coupling. You see what I'm saying? Uh, changes that have gone in the direction that essentially makes the global system more prone to crisis, right, uh, occurring in different uh, parts of it. Uh, so that's, in a nutshell, the, uh, uh, the argument. I have a few more things here that I may use if we have a, uh, a you know, depending on the questions. Uh, lastly, I want to bring to your attention to a uh, chart uh, table, a two by two, uh, that is in the last uh, chapter of the book. So based on uh, those indicators that I told you about earlier, this is like a uh, overall summary of uh, another aspect of the book, which is that I study um, specific cases of uh, issues in the world in terms of their complexity, which is the vertical dimension from low to high, and in terms of their coupling, uh, which ranges from low to high or loose to tight, okay? That would be a more accurate. And uh, in the book, I, I use uh, essentially three case studies to uh, try to illustrate how these dynamics take place, not just at the level of the global system, but also at the level of uh, specific subcomponents within the world, regions. So I, I do an entire analysis uh, about the EU and about uh, the Eurozone. And essentially, you can see over here that I argue that if you follow the arrows here, so the Eurozone uh, starts really in 1979. That's the uh, antecedent to it, right, with the uh, European, uh, with the EMS. And uh, the European Union starts, well, as you all know, back in the 1950s with the uh, six uh, original member countries. And essentially, what I argue in the book, and I you know, document uh, both uh, quantitatively and uh, with uh, case study material, is that uh, those two entities, the European Union, as we know it today, and the, uh, and the Eurozone, uh, over time have become both more complex and more tightly coupled, right? And again, I argue that the problem is really with the, uh, with the tight coupling. Uh, the second case study is about the uh, relationship between uh, the US and China, as something that I uh, think has defined the global economy for the last uh, 30 years, right? Um, and uh, as you can see over here, let's see if I can find it. Um, where is the uh, US-China uh, relationship over here? Don't tell me, sorry? Uh, I can't find, oh yeah, really, yeah, thank you, <laughs> thank you. So it starts over here in uh, 1989, as I documented in one of the chapters of the book, and then just evolves also more or less in the same, uh, along the same path, right? Diagonal path with increasing uh, complexity and tight coupling. The difference here is that I do consider the Eurozone to be a much more tightly coupled system than the European Union, right? For reasons that we can get into uh, later. Uh, and uh, also uh, to be much more tightly coupled than the US-China uh, uh, relationship. In other words, these other two systems over here, or subcomponents, have more degrees of freedom embedded in them, right? The degree of coupling is much, much lower. And uh, the third case study that I use uh, has to do with the uh, global financial crisis of, uh, you know, that started in the summer of 2007 and then exploded in the uh, fall of uh, 2008. And essentially over there, what I try to understand and I produce evidence in the book is the extent to which the financial systems of countries such as the United States or individual countries in Europe became over time not only more complex, but also much more tightly coupled. And that's what in the end produced, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the big uh, implosion that uh, we witnessed in the year 2008. So that's in a nutshell the, uh, the book, right? So again, just uh, 10 seconds, uh, just think in terms of those, uh, that two by two table, right? So you have uh, complexity and tight coupling, and uh, you have two levels at which, uh, you know, I'm applying that. So one is the dyadic relationship between nodes, the other one is the, uh, uh, the nodes themselves, right? Some of those things are shock diffusing, others produce shock absorption. Obviously, we would be better off if we had more shock absorbing elements in the system and fewer shock diffusing elements. That's, in a nutshell, the argument. Okay, thank you. Yep. And uh, thank you, Marv, for the uh, excellent book. I, some of you know I had knee replacement surgery three weeks ago, and I haven't been able to do much except great opportunity uh, One of the things that strikes me, and I'll try to illustrate here, is how similar the sort of thing that uh, Aro has uh, developed in his book is to what ecologists 
think about, but coming from a, uh, uh, from a somewhat different perspective. So that's what I'll try to highlight um, here. And a lot of the things that I'll talk about are really things that are from the book that Mara didn't get a chance to talk about. So in ecology for a half a century, there's been a debate, and it's an ongoing debate, about the relationship between diversity and complexity and stability or robustness of systems. One line of argument says more complex systems ought to be more stable because they have more uh, directions for adjustment, et cetera. More diverse systems should be more stable. But another line of reasoning, due largely to Robert May uh, 40 years ago, said the situation's just the reverse. It's like a house of cards. And I think you saw both sides of that in what Morrow developed. Bob May and I and George Sugihara in 2008, in between those two, and Morrow talks about this in his book, wrote a paper where we said we're just humble ecologists. Uh, but as we look at the, at the connectivity of the banking system, it reminds us of the overconnectivity of food webs and, um, and alerts us to the fact that maybe these systems are prime for collapse. And I was pleased that Morrow picked out this example. We said, who knows, for example, where the present concern over subprime loans will pan out. Well, this was, we wrote this in the spring of 2008, before the collapse. Um, and uh, I often say I'm sorry that I didn't actually read this paper in addition to writing it and, <laughs> and take this advice. It, the answer is the devil's in the details. It's, as Mauro tried to dissect, what does co complexity mean? What does diversity mean? What does stability and robustness mean? Um, David Tillman, for example, in classic experiments uh, in the grasslands in Minnesota shows that the more diverse the systems he's working with are, the more reliable and productive they are. But they are reliably productive simply because of what Morrow was emphasizing in, in his comments at the end. At the level of individual species, they come and go. And it's that ability for adjustment within that makes the macroscopic properties more predictable. One of my favorite examples is influenza, uh, which has been around for millennia. Even though once you get a particular strain of influenza, you'll never get it again, um, the strains come and go. The subtypes are much more robust. The robustness of influenza, the reason it's able to survive for so long, is because it doesn't care about the individual strains. They come, they go, mutations, replace them, um, and, um, and, but influenza persists. It persists because, basically, of, um, of the node complexity that Morrow was talking about. Um, so there, there are really two ways in these, what we call complex adaptive systems, that is systems that are made up of individual agents that interact with each other, in this case, strains of influenza, if you're, for example, an organism living in a turbulent environment, you could be like a coral and be rigid and resist the stress, and that may work for a while, or you can be like a bull kelp and go with the flow. It's not that one strategy is better than the other. One of them might be better over shorter periods of time, but both kinds of organisms exist in all whole uh, panoply in between. Um, but this is the more adaptive one, and this is the more resistant one. And in the long run, you've got to have some adaptiveness. So this is what Morrow, I think, is talking about when he talks about node coupling versus network coupling. Um, as the system becomes more interconnected, it wouldn't be so bad if you still had that complexity within the node that allowed uh, the adjustment. And the example that he gave at the end, the, the Eurozone, I was glad to read about this in the book because it always struck me that the Eurozone had built in too much structure. It lacked the flexibility to survive, and we've seen lots of the problems with it. Um, some coupling's a good thing, but a unified currency apparently is not a good thing, and particularly because the whole philosophy here is to suppress competition and to look for making everything the same, suppressing cultural diversity. And this I'm taking straight out of Morrow's book, implying German economic standards to the whole system, and then expecting also Germany to change to accept prior, higher price inflation, et cetera. We need within country solutions to allow this adaptation, and it's not there. And it's this rigidity that Mara was talking about at the end 
that makes the system um, less robust. So I had a, actually two questions for Morrow, and the first one is in the next slide. In what way is the Eurozone different than the United States, which does have a common currency? Or different than Canada, which is not exactly like the United States, it's more of a federation of independent uh, states. Or on the other hand, different from Yugoslavia, or different from having something like Bitcoin that uh, Maro talks a lot uh, about. And there's a commons problem too, which is once you have something like the Eurozone, maybe it's not a good idea to keep adding more countries, but once it exists, the smaller countries in particular um, may feel that they want to join. So um, there's another complexity Bob Cohane has uh, emphasized to me a lot, which is we're not just talking about states. There are lots of other structures that are superimposed uh, on top of this. This is showing banking things, but they're multinational corporations. There's the Fed, the Bank of England, the European Central Bank. There are organizations like NATO. The connectivity is not just through states on one uh, network interacting with each other. There's a lot more complexity uh, in the system, and I don't think we understand what that means. So, as Morrow em emphasizes in his book, it's all about feedbacks. Uh, the stability of any complex system is encoded in the feedback loops that govern the processes. We tend to think about positive feedback loops as destabilizing. Positive feedback loops, meaning a, a, a disturbance, um, is self-enhancing and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that negative feedback loops are stabilizing, but Many of us know the story of Galloping Gertie, the uh, Tacoma Narrows Bridge, in which an instability, which was stable, began to build up even bigger and bigger. So negative feedback loops, as you point out in your book, if too strong, can also be destabilizing. Um, Andy Lowe and I have been working together. Andy Lowe is an a expert on the financial system. This, we published a series of papers, this one in the PNAS, uh, on what we can learn about the regulation of the, of the financial system from these sorts of ideas. One of the things which Morrow touches on in the book are regulatory mismatches. So for example, if you have a system that's functioning well and some element of it changes, most of these systems, I mean, if there's a stimulus, something increases and then some feedback loop stabilizes it. But what happens if that gets out of whack? For example, uh, with program trading, um, with high-speed trading so that you can now make trades much more quickly than before, but the regulatory system hasn't caught up with it. Uh, this reminded uh, me, um, and I wouldn't spell apnea that way, but I guess that is a legitimate spelling of uh, a physiological breakdown of a feedback loop called chain-stokes breathing. Normally we go through nice, regular rhythms of breathing, but Sometimes people get into something which is called chain Stokes breathing, which is an alternation between very rapid breathing and then no breathing, and then very rapid breathing and no breathing. And that's because the feedback loop is not operating fast enough to keep the system functioning properly. Well, that's what can happen. That is what is happening with the financial system. If that happens, you've got to address, there are two ways to address it. One is you've either got to improve the feedback system or you've got to slow down the process, for example, by putting a one cent per share tax on trades. That's one idea that's been suggested uh, to, to get the system back um, under control. And we, I've talked about all of those things that are grayed out there, like contagion and nonlinearities, but synchrony is something that, um, that goes along with tighter coupling that Morrow emphasizes in this book. As systems become more synchronized, Disturbances that occur here also occur here, and you can't depend upon the, the separation of those which is stabilizing the system. So I've turned Morrow's book around uh, and talk about the architecture of robustness. Well, and, and this is an, something which I actually uh, have been writing about for some years. What are the structural features that make systems uh, robust? And how have they gone wrong in the systems that Morrow has talked about? Well, one of, the, one of the features is that there's redundancy built into, into systems. For example, when, when one of the flu vaccine makers had a contaminated vaccine some, a few years ago, luckily there was another 
uh, maker of the flu vaccine. Luckily, it was not a bad year for flu, and there was no crisis, but there could have been. There wasn't much redundancy built into the system. The term degeneracy really means we have redundancy, but it, it, it doesn't have to be the identical component. It may be multiple components performing the same function. But the other two features that I want to emphasize that Morrow talks uh, even more about are diversity and heterogeneity, and he emphasized that in his comments. For an evolutionary biologist, that's the key. You need diversity in order for the system to be able to adapt. If you suppress that diversity, if you suppress the cultural diversity uh, in the Eurozone, you've reduced the capacity for innovation and the ability of the system to, to adapt. So maintaining diversity and heterogeneity is crucial, and maintaining modularity, that is compartmentalization, reducing network connectivity, is another feature that reduces the spread. In, in infectious disease research, research, we often have examples of diseases which take off and burn out, either within some country or within some um, risk group, but the modularity of the system creates essentially fire breaks, and the spread is not uh, throughout the whole system. But as the network becomes more interconnected, we're losing that modularity. One example, and Morrow talks about this in his book, is the repeal of Glass-Steagall. This was the, um, the banking regulation um, that came in after the Great Depression that restricted what banks could do. They couldn't try and do everything. They had to separate themselves. That, that created some modularity in the banking system. Uh, during the 1990s, this was repealed. It was a bipartisan effort that repealed it. And this was a major contributor, in my opinion, to the, uh, um, to the crisis that we saw in the 2008, 2009. A reduction of modularity, a reduction of heterogeneity in terms of the kinds of units in the system, and overall, therefore, a reduced robustness of the system. Um, one of the things I found interesting in Morrow's book is he talks not just about the features, but gives some implications about the dynamics of robustness. So for example, institutional isomorphism, which is something he talks a lot about towards the end, which means that different agents tend to try to become or are forced to become more like each other, um, that obviously reduces heterogeneity in the system. It can lead to tighter network coupling. It can lead to reduced modularity, increased correlation, uh, increased synchrony, and in reduced heterogeneity and therefore to reduce robustness. So we're all part of a dynamic that is reducing um, the robustness of these systems. Ultimately, one of the lessons I take home from this and from, um, and from other work I've done, that if you're, when, when you want to regulate systems for robustness, the two extreme points of view both need to be rejected. One is the essentially free market approach that you just let everything go without a regulation, and the other is the over-regulated system. We're going to need ultimately a balance between top-down uh, regulation and bottom-up mechanisms that provide the independence, the innovation that Morrow talks about. So here's the second question that I'm going to pose to you. One of the interesting things for me that Morrow talks about in the book is looking at what the reserve currency, that is the currency that everybody depends upon, uh, has been in the world going back um, six uh, centuries um, when, when Portugal was, when Spain was, et cetera, uh, when Britain was for the pound for 105 years, when the dollar was, and he gives evidence that the dollar is declining. It's still the leading reserve currency, and he argues that the, that, that the Chinese coin is not going to become, uh, is not going to become the next one. But my question is, must there be a next one? Uh, or are we moving to a system where maybe there won't be a reserve currency, where there'll be a basket of currencies? And I don't remember what I had under, but it may have been Bitcoin or something underneath that, uh, that picture there. So that's the second question I wanted to pose to you. So with that, I, I, I want to thank you for the chance to read your book and to, to, to the resume. Should I answer like very briefly? And then, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Just the two questions. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, you know, it's also exposed, I think, an important uh, 
an important uh, weakness in the book, which I think uh, uh, you know, in future work I should, I should address, which is that I do talk about, as you mentioned, redundancy and diversity and heterogeneity, uh, but I really don't talk that much about modularity and synchrony. Hmm. Uh, and uh, I think those two other aspects of the... Well, I think you really talk about modularity, you just don't use that term. I mean, you yeah. talk about network connectivity. Not and things. explicitly, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I, need to, uh, I need to do that. But to your questions very quickly. Uh, so the first one, uh, uh, how is the uh, European Union different than the United States? And I don't want to answer this question in terms of uh, optimal currency areas. That's what uh, you know, some folks uh, do mm -hmm. in, in economics. My answer, let me just give you two, uh, two examples as to how the two are very different. And, uh, and therefore, why is uh, the euro a, a shaky uh, you know, currency and, uh, and a race, right? So the first one has to do with labor mobility. Uh, I think it is fundamental that you have a, uh, a labor market uh, that is unified, right? Because otherwise, you get the situation that you have today with unemployment in Germany below 5%, if I remember correctly, but unemployment in Southern Europe above, uh, uh, you know, in some cases, 20%, and among, the young, among young people, about uh, 45%, right? Uh, but why is that the case? Well, because of lack of labor mobility. Uh, so here in the United States, uh, every year, about 3% of the population uh, crosses the state border, okay? Which is a very high rate of mobility, right? Uh, and that is a proxy for labor mobility, right? I mean, that's the population uh, in, in, uh, as a whole. So that also includes people who maybe are moving from Ohio to Florida, right, for, for, uh, uh, for retirement. But, but it's a good proxy. Now, in Europe, that number, which in the United States, if I remember correctly, is about 3%. In Europe, uh, and the distances, remember, between Sweden and Greece are the same distances from California to Massachusetts, right? In Europe, the number is 0.2%. And if you exclude Luxembourg, it drops to 0.1%. Okay. Now, why? Well, there's cultural barriers, there's language barriers, there's all sorts of other barriers, right? There's less experience with that kind of mobility. It's a collection of labor markets, even within countries, right? Southern uh, uh, Italy is very different from Northern Italy. Southern Spain is very different from Northern Spain. West and East, uh, all sorts of differences, right? But I think that's one fundamental fact that people forget about. So therefore, you have a European Central Bank saying this is a monetary policy, and it's supposed to apply to an environment in which unemployment is less than 5%, and an environment in which unemployment is about 20%. All I would say is good luck with that, right? And then the second thing is, um, if I may, instead of going down the economic path, so the, the theory of currency optimal uh, areas, you know, shows that the U.S. is not a currency optimal currency area, right? Uh, but neither is Europe. And actually Europe is much farther away, right, from, from that. But the other explanation that I would give as a sociologist, and forgive me for being a little bit trivial with this, but I think it doesn't matter. Uh, in Germany, uh, in the German language, uh, there's one single word, for both debt, guilt. So if you want to refer to debt or to guilt in the German language, there's only one word, should. I can assure you that in Italian, in Spanish, in Catalan, I'm looking at uh, Carlos here, there's two different words for that, right? Actually, culturally speaking, being into debt in Southern Europe, or most of Southern Europe, I should say, it's perceived as being smart, right? Why? Well, because those uh, traditionally have been high inflation countries. So it is smart to be uh, deeply into debt when the situation is one in which there's high inflation, right? And of course, there are totally, you know, totally different norms and values and expectations, right? When you go to a place like Germany, right? So again, I'm trivializing things a little bit by saying, you know, that there's only one single word in German for those two things, but I think it does matter, right? I mean, the, the kinds of norms and values that underlie economic behavior and the way in which people make decisions about very basic things that then aggregate at the macro level and produce these very difficult situations uh, are vastly different within, within Europe. And my observation uh, is that over the last uh, 15 years or so, especially since the introduction of the common currency, those differences in Europe have become greater, not smaller, right? So they have become way bigger as opposed to smaller, precisely, I think, as a result, in part, of these attempts to, uh, to homogenize and to, uh, yep. to introduce these things. Now, the second question, I forgot at home my crystal ball, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, um, but I think we need to distinguish between the short term and the long term. Uh, in the short term, I think uh, we should all expect the dollar to, uh, to become stronger, right? For, for obvious reasons that I think economists can explain better than anybody else, right? I mean, the fundamentals are such that the dollar will strengthen, right? 
Uh, but I think that over the long run, there's only one way the dollar can go unless something uh, really fundamentally changes. And I, I go into these details uh, about that in the book. I think we are coming towards the end of this very long cycle uh, that you had on that slide. Um, could you, could you uh, put it again? Because I think it's really uh, uh, helpful, right? Uh, you know, we've never had a uh, reserve currency. Uh, we've never had uh, the currency that um, helps uh, the global economy balance itself, mm -hmm. right? In terms of, uh, well, you have surpluses in some parts of okay, the world, you have deficits. Do you remember which one I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah it's, it's towards the end. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the U.S. economy was very different and the global economy was very different when the dollar became uh, the centerpiece of the global financial architecture. That started, as you point out there, in the 1920s, but more clearly in 1944 with the Bretton Woods Agreement, right? At the time, the U.S. economy was about 55% of the global economy, nearly 60%. Uh, I don't know whether you've checked uh, that figure, uh, the most recent figure, but it's about 18%. That's what the US economy represents of the global economy. That percentage, most likely, will continue to go down. That doesn't mean that the US economy is not performing well. That means that other economies, the average economy in the world grows faster, right? It's just a natural thing to happen, right? And uh, so I, I have, uh, just only from, you know, for starters, from that point of view, I have serious uh, doubts as to whether we can continue to rely on the dollar, right? But I would like to quote, um, I think it was Barry Eichengreen, which I think uh, most of you know, the uh, economic historian at Berkeley. You know, he said, you know, and I, 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 I totally agree with him, right? The fact that we have the dollar as the centerpiece of the global financial architecture is an accident of history. That was never the intention, right? It's a pure accident, but it has been a convenient one. And the problem, of course, is that we don't have a replacement. So uh, let's see how long it lasts. But it is very, very clear that for the type of economy that we have in the world, in which we have surpluses in some parts of the world, and we have deficits hmm. in others, and we have a lot of trade, and we have a lot of investment, we have a lot of these flows, you need a currency or currencies, right? It could also be in the plural, that play that fundamental role over there. Uh, the problem is that right now the alternatives are all, you know, even more problematic than the dollar itself, right? Well, you give an argument for why the when maybe you won't be. Uh, Sorry. You give an argument for why the Chinese currency will not be. There. Well, the problem there is that we just don't trust it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, for a fire currency to be uh, uh, to be. Uh, well, you had a, a list. Role, you had a list. Trust it. You had a list of eight points. And, uh, I think. Yeah, there's. Uh, yeah, I don't remember all of them right now in the spur of the moment. But essentially, there's uh, you know eight arguments about how. Well, there's eight things that uh, essentially give pause to people in terms of uh, trusting the Chinese currency, right? One of them is that it's not convertible. Its value is manipulated by the government, and we just saw that uh, two summers ago, right? Another one is that there's no rule of law, right? In the U.S., if you buy a security denominated in U.S. dollars, and you feel cheated by the issue of that security, you sue, right? Which is the national sport here, right? But there's a legal system that supports you as an investor. In China, if you buy a security denominated in renminbi, whether it's issued by the government or issued by, a, um, uh, by some level of the government, or it's issued by a corporate entity, right, by a corporate company, and that uh, you feel cheated, you lose 50% of the value, right, in your investment, what do you do? You don't sue, right? You write it off or you cry, right? That's what you do, right? There's no legal system supporting that. Oh, no, 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 right? I mean, there's a number of reasons why I don't think renminbi in the foreseeable future, maybe in 20 years from now or 30 years from now, right, that the situation will be different. But right now, the institutional conditions are not there, right? There's no freedom of uh, uh, capital movements across, uh, you know, the border, all sorts of, of, of issues, right? So that's, that's the way in which I would answer the, uh, the two questions. But more importantly, uh, what I want to emphasize is that I think, uh, you know, I, I'd like to pursue some of the uh, connections that you uh, made explicit uh, between this um, organizational sociological story, right? and the ecological one, and uh, I should say that for those of you who haven't read the Ecology for Bankers piece, I think it's just a, uh, you know, a wonderful uh, statement as to how all of these things come together uh, and produce these very difficult situations in which uh, the system just, uh, you know, uh, collapsed. Right? And that's what happened in, in 08. Somebody sharing about uh, yeah. um, I, I want to get back to your theory. Okay. I've heard economists talk about this. Um, I, I think it's a fascinating uh, um, argument, and I'm, I'm convinced about the diversity robustness argument, but I'm not convinced about the complexity coupling. I don't. I, I see why coupling is reduces uh, robustness, but complexity seems to me much too aggregated a category to generalize about its effects. So I. So internal migration, as you say, is robustness 
increasing, but refugee migration is not robust, it's increasing in the current world. And they're both increases in complexity. Uh, liberal trade is, in your view, is seen as increasing complexity, but it's the fundamental source of the loss of diversity internally, because liberal trade, by Adam Smithian principles, is specialization, division of labor. So I don't, I don't, I think you should drop the com the argument uh, about well, complexity. You're pointing out, uh, no, you're, I, I, I really uh, appreciate your comment because I think you pointed out uh, two um, inconsistencies. I don't know whether the inconsistencies are just uh, you know superficial or they're actually uh, something that I need to think more about. It. I'm going to take a note now. Uh, uh, but you're absolutely correct, uh, especially on the second one, which is that. Uh, all right. So on the one hand, trade. Uh, if I understood your argument correctly, it's something that I argue provides for more complexity, right. Right. and therefore that's good because you know there's more circuits, there's more paths, right? Uh, so let me just show you an example, an example shot. When the uh, earthquake in Japan uh, right, uh, that uh, provoked the uh, the uh, nuclear accident as well, uh, yes, another that was an external shot. So we can treat this as a natural experiment. Another issue that uh, uh, that uh, very quickly uh, came up was that uh, within a few days, a lot of factories in the world, around the world, became idle, right? Because, uh, you know, in this uh, integrated global economy, you know, we have uh, that state in the media, so, right? So I make a, uh, I think it's a very important distinction there, so I need to think more about your comment, but the distinction is the following. If we're talking about trade and final goods, I think it's undeniably something that probably, I think even, even, even uh, uh, you know, with the objection that you're raising probably contributes to shock absorption, uh, in the sense that, uh, uh, however, if we're talking about trading intermediates, as I argue, it's not about it is more about uh, right. Uh, so, and again, the uh, the external shock uh, with uh, factories around the world becoming idle uh, because of that uh, would uh, you know volumes. Would. So, I think uh, we need to, uh, to be more analytical about the different kinds of trade and. Uh, and uh, That As I said at the beginning, more like a man, yeah. rather than and, you know, like a you know, polished general theory about how this works, right? And, uh, uh, not not watertight. Right? Right? There's a lot of issues. But thank, thank you. you. So, Mal, yeah. we have you sit here. Okay. And we'll, <laughs> use, All right. we'll use that microphone for the questions. Okay. <laughs> so, Mauro, let me push you a little bit. Um, and this is going a little bit of what Simon says. You don't talk about system. You don't really really talk about systems. You talk about architecture, and it seems. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful book, all the academic praise, etc. But my biggest critique is you don't think about how the very units have been transformed. That because of the increasing complexity and in coupling, you do have a complex adaptive system. And one of the characteristics of complex adaptive systems is emergent properties. That there are properties to the system that cannot be traced back to any individual parts. Your model is very much about contagion. The, 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 the contagion going across the arcs and the ability of the node to absorb that contagion. What I'm wondering is that there's another level of analysis. And, and we have, and there's regulations for that because we have governance structures for those nodes. What we don't have are regulations for the system as a whole, where the danger might not come from one sick patient infecting another, but from the interaction of these two patients producing a disease that neither of them is responsible for. And, and that, that, in a sense, is a real challenge. It's not how does an individual node protect itself from an infected environment, necessarily. But how does that environment start producing diseases, if you will, that can't be traced down to one node and can't be, you, you know, modularity, and modularity may be the only way to stop it since it, it, since it, the, it, it stops the degree of, 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 of coupling. But how do you feel about that? Uh, no, you're absolutely right. So that's, that's yet another, I think, area that needs uh, to be developed, right? Uh, so I do not, uh, you're absolutely correct, I mean, I do not uh, venture in that, into that kind of territory, right, in the book at all, right, uh, especially in terms of the emerging properties. I do um, devote some attention to the issue that we're trying to uh, cope in the world at the system level, right, or at the so top component level, maybe at the regional level within Europe or in uh, different parts of the world. 
with uh, supranational institutions that were designed for a totally different kind of work. And I do, I do get into that, and this is, uh, you know, a uh, something that has been brought up by many people. Uh, I'm in, in no way the first person to point that out. Right? But obviously, uh, many of the uh, financial, economic, uh, even political institutions that we have uh, for global governance uh, were pro first proposed for a very different kind of work. In which Europe and the United States were, you know, 80% of the action, and now we're in a very different situation. Right? Uh, you know, I always try to, uh, I always like to uh, uh, remind folks that uh, within uh, 15 years or so, 70% uh, of the global economy is going to be in Asia. 70%. Right? Uh, and the European Union and the United States are going to be tiny in that context within 15 years, unless something really strange happens. Right? And that's because, uh, you know, you have population trends and you have purchasing power of those populations shifting also very quickly. You multiply those two numbers and you get a lot of change very quickly. Right? This kind of so I totally agree with you with the uh, previous uh, question. Uh, that is uh, a part of the argument that, uh, that, that remains uh, totally under the so, uh, yeah. Miguel, c c commenting on, on, on your point, you know, when you, if you get infected with influenza, you begin to develop antibodies. It takes about a week for those antibodies to develop, by which time you're either better or you're not. So your recovery probably doesn't have much to do with the development of specific antibodies. However, it does protect you against getting it again, and it does reduce the possibility of it bouncing back and forth. And so this emergent property, I mean, I don't know how much of a factor that's been in, in its evolution, but it has these system level effects, too. I, I want to ask a question uh, that's a bit more specific and not so much um, just about, like, an academically general thing, but I want to ask about, you brought up Glass-Steagall at one point, Professor Levin, um, the ramifications that that had for the banking system. And I wanted to ask why you think that, um, or why it is the case even, that just the benefits of specialization and perhaps like the effects of density dependence on maybe like how adaptive or competitive the strategy is, hasn't like counteracted you know, this tends to homogenize banking and for all banks to do everything altogether. Like, why is it that, that Glass-Steagall is needed, I guess? Oh, Glass-Steagall. Okay, well, I mean, I'll comment, comment on Glass-Steagall, but then you, you should yeah. comment. The, the, the point about Glass-Steagall was... Uh, I, I make the same point. Like yeah. Right? yeah. And by the way, the, the, can, the Canadian banks um, weathered the 2008-2009 much, much better than the U.S. banks. The, the U.S. banks were all into everything. Uh, so they were all like each other. Uh, to a first approximation, and, um, and they all got into trouble. Whereas if you, had a, if you had a system in which there was some isolation, you would, you would have had more modularity, you would have had more diversity and, and more limitation. Um, the, the other question you ask is a, is a little more complicated, which um, why doesn't the system sort of self-organize so that everybody's doing something different. But I think the interconnectedness of the banking system makes it different than the ecological systems that you uh, conf confront, where there aren't independent niches. The banking system was so integrated and uh, that uh, in unless you were walled off from it, you were, uh, you were drawn into it. But, uh, but these are really, Mauro should comment on. Well, just uh, very quickly, so, so you're raising a very important point. Just uh, uh, I want to add one other dimension that you didn't mention, I think is relevant. But before I do that, let me just recap the, the original argument, right? Illustrated with the, uh, with the case of uh, Glass-Steagall. So the problem is not necessarily that you uh, tear down the wall separating investment banking from yeah. other types of banking activities, especially the deposit taking and you know, the more traditional banking, right? Uh, because, hey, uh, those are called universal banks, and in Europe, for many years, we had. Uh, so this continues not to work. Yes. Um, Fragile system. Uh, <laughs> is this working now? Uh, I'll, I'll, okay. Um, uh, in um, in uh, Western Europe, and uh, we've had universal banks for a long time, right? The issue with Glass Steagall was that you repealed Glass Steagall, right? Uh, but you didn't change the fragmented regulatory structure that existed, uh, with uh, at least uh, 12 or 13 different. Uh, entities within the uh, U.S. federal government overseeing these things. Uh, and, uh, for instance, uh, you know, uh, derivatives uh, are uh, overseen by um, uh, the Department of Agriculture because uh, the whole thing started with uh, uh, future markets for, in Chicago for uh, agricultural commodities, right? 
But let me just illustrate, uh, further illustrate this with the case of AIG, which was perhaps the most spectacular collapse in the crisis, right? So this is an insurance company that get, gets into banking. And what brought it down was not the insurance part, it was the banking, the investment banking side. And it wasn't the US operations, it was the uh, London-based operations. Essentially 70 people working in London. That's what brought down AIG, right? A multi-billion dollar um, uh, financial uh, conglomerate. So there were two things going on. One was regulatory fragmentation. The other one was a race to the bottom. Why did they set up those operations in London? Well, because in London you could get away with more things, right? It was a more, uh, you know, London was trying to compete for business. Uh, to recover ground, you know, to, uh, to uh, close the gap with New York. So therefore, they uh, had more lax regulations, right? So that's why AIG, JP Morgan, everybody, uh, Lehman Brothers, they set up their um, most, uh, uh, you know, dangerous uh, uh, operations in London because uh, they could get away with that, right? Uh, given the regulatory structure over there. So who was overseeing uh, that part of AIG? Uh, well, uh, it was the Office of Thrift. Supervision. Are you familiar with that agency, OTS? It's supposed to uh, uh, supervise, right, and regulate um, small community outlets, right? Not AIG, right? So why were they supervising AIG? Well, because in a provision, uh, I don't recall now whether it was part of the repeal of the Glass-Steagall or some ancillary, uh, you know, piece of legislation or regulation. You know what happened? The banks, right, that now were merging, you know, with each other and they were getting, you know, making acquisitions and were becoming more universal banks. They asked the question in the late 1990s is, okay, we're confused because up until, uh, you know, while Glass-Steagall was in place, we knew who was our regulator, right? You know what I'm saying? We've known since the 1930s. But now I have businesses in several areas and, you know, they're all interrelated and apparently a different regulator should be in charge of uh, keeping an eye on me. So you know what the government did? I don't remember exactly uh, who uh, uh, introduced this thing. Is that you get to choose your regulator. If you don't believe me, just go in the book. There's uh, the whole documentation for that, right? So what did AIG do? They chose the Office of Free Supervision. Why? Because they didn't have a clue as to how financial markets in London operated, right? You know what I'm saying? They chose, you know, the regulator that had no expertise no staff, no budget to oversee something like that. That was the problem, in my view, right? Uh, and that's what I say in the book. So you, you want to repeat Glass-Steagall, fine. I mean, European banks have been operating as universal banks. Not that they're perfect, obviously, and they do a lot of trouble now, right? Uh, but at least they have a single regulator who has a 360-degree view of what's going on. You see what I'm saying? But that's not what happened at the time Glass-Steagall was repealed. Quite on the contrary. We continue to have fragmentation, and banks were given the option. So come on, whom do you choose as your regulator, right? Somebody who's understaffed, who doesn't have a clue as to what's going on in the world, who doesn't understand all of those products, right? You see what I'm saying? So you, you need to add the, this other dimension, a regulatory race to the bottom, competition between London and New York. That was, I think, of fundamental importance, right, to understand that. The system also became more tightly coupled to the point that 60 people in London or 70 people in London, through their actions, could bring down a mammoth uh, financial conglomerate uh, uh, such as uh, AIG. You see what I'm saying? Uh, by the way, I'm not the only person who, who says that. Uh, Simon, I think, also agrees, but there's a whole bunch of other people who also, mm. you know, say, I just uh, reconceptualize the whole problem in terms of complexity and coupling, right? Um, thank you for the talk. And Throughout the talk actually and the question and answering, I feel like there's a bit of a tension between this implicit claim that diversity is good, that that's what gives us robustness, and then like a lot of the conversations about how we need the, the regulatory fragmentation and that there wasn't enough coherence on some of the sides. And I guess in the end of the day, as, as the sociologists, we, wanna, we care about like construct validity, which in the social world is incredibly difficult maybe compared to the, even the ecological world. And to me, it's sometimes I'm like diversity in what? At what level are we talking about? So like, for example, cancer cells are the kind of cells that doesn't re respond to growth of like, you know, the stopping the cell signal. That's a kind of diverse cell. Are we celebrating that, right? Like that's diversity, does that make it robust? I mean, it's not robust for the body, it's not robust for the human, yeah. but it's a robust in terms of the type of cells we see. Yeah. And then in terms of the diversity, like in, in what we're seeing, now the U.S. is having a lot more overseas uh, extrajudicial 
jurisdictional regulation in terms of the taxes, FACA, in terms of FCPA, in terms of money laundering. That, in the framing, could be a type of homogenizing force, but in a lot of people's views, it's also helping to regulate some of these um, complexities and, and, and risk. So, you know, like, what is this diversity that inherently leads to robustness about, and is there a role for homogeneity in any sense? There's a role for self-regulation and for our system, immune system. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So let me answer, and I think uh, Simon should also, uh, 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 you know, lean on this, uh, on this question as well. So as I understand in ecology, I think uh, you actually made that uh, explicit. There's some people who argue that it's uh, better to have diversity, and others, uh, other scholars in the field argue that the opposite is true, right? I mean, you, you alluded to that. Uh, my argument uh, as a sociologist, right, so this is about, uh, you know, the, uh, the other kind of uh, uh, issues that uh, you, were, uh, you were talking about, is that, um, so let, let's just start with the, with the level of the, uh, of the system, uh, that if there's a shock, right, and uh, every unit in that system reacts in the same way because they all have similar characteristics and they're all structured in the same way and they have the same kinds of uh, uh, relationships to all of the other nodes and all that, then uh, most likely the response is going to be the same, right? If the response is not, uh, if the response is effective at dealing with the shock, then we're all good, right? But if it's not, then you're in deep trouble. You see what I'm saying? Uh, so that's essentially the crux of the argument. Now, I do believe uh, that in some of the subcomponents that have emerged, uh, for example, uh, in, in Europe, I, you know, uh, I don't mean, I don't understand why they invite me to give talks in Europe anymore, because every time that I go, I rail against uh, the uh, efforts by the European Commission to homogenize everything, right? Um, and uh, I offer some examples in the book, right? Because I think that destroys, you know, the basis for innovation, for creativity, uh, for different kinds of solutions to emerge. You see what I'm saying? So that's the kind of argument that I'm making, right? Uh, but in the, in the field of ecology, right, um, and I, I have heard about this before listening to you today, apparently there is a split, right, as to which one is, uh, yeah. is uh, better, right? In the field of economics, by the way, and uh, he already left, but uh, it's very clear, right, that uh, specialization leads to uh, diversity, right? So we have diverse economies in the world, right? Uh, and uh, that is actually something that is fostered, that is promoted by free trade, by, you know, the dynamic of the market. You see what I'm saying? Uh, it's not something that is supposed to be causing necessarily homogeneity or convergence. You see what I'm saying? Um, uh, we lay out, uh, you know Nicole Bigard, the, um, the sociologist at uh, UC Davis, so she and I have a paper that uh, came out uh, maybe 15 years or so ago. I was still junior at the time. Uh, and uh, that, uh, in that paper we lay out the argument in more detail. So I don't know, are, are you in sociology or in the social sciences? Yeah, so I would refer to you in ASR and uh, we go through the, uh, you know, the different kinds of arguments about uh, uh, you know, this theory of diversity and how uh, it is actually better for the economy, right, than, than thinking about, you know, in terms of homogeneity and, uh, and convergence. But you want to comment on the ecology? Uh, yeah, sure. A um, couple of points. First of all, with any of these concepts like redundancy, diversity, modularity, it's not a question of the more is better. It, it's that you have to find the balance and some degree of, of, of um, heterogeneity, some degree of modularity is, is, is crucial. Uh, much of the debate in ecology is not about um, the specific forms of the, but rather about the, what the words mean that, that, that all of these are, are, are a complexity, diversity, stability. These are words that we all have a sense of and people are applying them in different ways. But and, uh, and as Miguel pointed out, all of these are, including your example of, of the cancer cells, are complex adaptive systems where you have individual agents giving rise to emergent properties, and that automatically means there's going to be a conflict of interest between the interests of the agents and the interests of the whole system. And that's true whether you're talking about nations in a global economy or individuals in an economy or cells within the body, or even um, the diversity within a university or a company. So how, how, what does that mean to do? It means that, that if you're running a company, if you're running a university, you encourage diversity, but then you have some selection mechanism um, which um, applies regulation, and when, when, when there are destructive elements, you, you get rid of them. And that's what the body does in general, but sometimes uh, we, we lose control. So, so cancer growth is a breakdown of the commons, 
in which the short-term interests of the individual cells uh, override the interest. By the way, um, tumors themselves de depend upon the production of cytokines and other compounds that are cr crucial for the growth. And so I've been working with an oncologist trying to take advantage of this to engineer cells that don't produce those to, to get at the, at the commons problem at one level down. But you're absolutely right, not any kind of diversity is automatically a, a, a good thing. Okay, and with that, we have to get you, because you have to be on a plane tomorrow. So I want to get you home at some, don't you have to be on a plane no, tomorrow? No, no, yeah, no. You don't even know about this yet. Know. <laughs> no, that I know. They, what you're being no, sent back. The EU, being sent back but it's a good excuse. The, the EU wants to talk to you, Mauro. Uh, and on with that note, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was, that was fun. Thank you.